Courtney Weatherburn, and here's what's ahead for you in 7 News tonight. Belize's precious coral reefs facing the greatest threat yet. Tonight, we'll tell you about stony coral tissue loss disease and how it can decimate Belize's reef. And they say he broke his common law's leg. And we'll show you how a mob, a mob broke up a man's SUV in retaliation. Also, of all the lively sparring sessions from today's Senate meeting, and Belize youth footballers kicking it on another level. Tonight you'll see the teenage teams that have starred in Central America and the Caribbean. These stories and much more are ahead on 7 News tonight, so please stay tuned. The first to bring nationwide high-speed fiber internet to Belize is again taking you into the future with the opening of our state-of-the-art Digi Signature Store, offering the amazing service you've come to expect from Digi. This ultra-modern signature store at 2.5 Philip Colson Highway is the place to buy the latest devices, sign up for Digi services, pay your Digi bills, and take advantage of all Digi deals and promotions. The first of its kind in Belize, the Signature Store offers the most amazing customer experience with its new and innovative design featuring the latest in technology and a gaming center powered by the fastest DigiNet speeds. Visit the Digi Signature Store today for an experience unlike any other. Come see what Digi has in store for you. evolving and is an important part of our everyday lives. That is why we at Atlantic Bank are committed to use the latest technology to make our customers' banking experience easier, convenient, and most of all, secure. We now offer you chip and contactless cards. These cards contain an embedded chip which generates a unique security code each time you perform a transaction, making it virtually impossible to copy your card's information. It's like a new password created for every transaction. You can be more confident than ever that you are protected, giving you the peace of mind that you need when making everyday purchases. Using your chip and contactless card is easy. For a chip transaction, Insert your card into the POS terminal face up, chip first, and follow the prompts. Leave your card in the POS until the transaction is complete. Remove your card and sign your receipt. Performing a contactless transaction is even easier. Tap your card on the POS terminal, wait for the beep to confirm your payment, and go. Remember, use your card to make everyday purchases anywhere you see the Visa logo displayed. Atlantic Bank, chip and contactless cards. One card, two ways to pay. Atlantic Bank, building the future together. Dengue and Zika alert. Do your part by preventing mosquito breeding. The Ministry of Health reminds the public that as we enter the rainy season, be aware of the dangers of dengue, chikungunya, and zika. These are infectious diseases that are transmitted by the bite of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. These mosquitoes are most active in early morning and late afternoon. 
Activities that should be done to prevent dengue and Zika include Avoid having containers that can collect water in your yard. Cover water storage containers such as drums. Change the water in flower pots every four or five days. These are ideal breeding sites for the mosquito. With the elimination of breeding sites in and around the yard, dengue and Zika can be avoided. Dengue and Zika begin with sudden onset of high fever. Other signs and symptoms include rash, joint pain, eye pain. If you are pregnant or planning to become pregnant, we advise you to visit your nearest health facility. The public is also encouraged to use mosquito repellent spray or lotion on the body or clothing. Do your part by preventing mosquito breeding. A health and wellness message from your Ministry of Health. Life moves fast. Be prepared with Sagicor. Learn more at sagicorlife.com. Central TV and Internet Branch Office in Belmopan is relocating. Effective August 19, 2019. Our new address will be the Belmopan Tucan Plaza. We thank you for your loyalty and look forward to serving you from our new location. Next Gen, powered by Central TV and Internet. Welcome back. In July, the Fisheries Department sent out a release alerting the country of a new disease affecting the corals in this region. It's called Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease, and it's killing the corals in the Bacalar Chico Marine Reserve, which is the only area it has been detected in so far in Belize. Well, the Fisheries Department, along with its NGO partners, have been busy trying to get a hold of this disease by researching and testing different treatment options. Cameraman Cody Norales and I tagged along with the Coral Reef Monitoring Task Force on an expedition to the Bacalar Chico Marine Reserve to see firsthand the damage this disease is causing and what the team is doing to try to prevent it from spreading. Here's that special feature on what can only be described as the most detrimental coral disease this region has seen. About 28 miles from San Pedro on the northern tip of Ambergris Key, is the Bacalar Chico Marine Reserve. This snaking waterway is called the Bacalar Chico Canal, and it's a slow, calm boat ride between lush mangrove fringes. And from this lazy backwater, it goes to the wide open sea. Now, while the waters shimmer on the surface, that is not the case down below. This is a dead brain coral. It is only one of many brain corals in five different areas of the Bacalar Chico Marine Reserve that have what is called stony coral tissue loss disease, or SCTLD for short. It is also taking over pillar corals, such as this one, and star corals. 
This deadly disease was first spotted in Florida in 2014, and since then it has affected nearly half of their stony coral species on the Florida reef tract. There are more questions than answers as to the origin and cause of this disease, but what is clear is that it is the most devastating disease affecting corals in this region right now. It has already spread to countries in the Caribbean, but it only became a major concern for Belize when it struck the adjoining reef system in Ixcalac, Mexico. And in late June, the alarm was sounded when it was detected in the Bacalar Chico Marine Reserve. Fortunately, it has not been found in any other area in Belize so far. Blue Ventures does work here in Bacalar Chico and Ixcalac is the neighboring Mexican village. So it, they, this was very alarming to us. So we started keeping an eye out at um, the corals. So we went out on a survey one day. I was leading the dive. Um, that was about a month ago. Um, I was leading the dive and I was noticing very, um, very different alarming changes in the reef because I wasn't out here for about two months and si since I'm the one that's more accustomed at looking at the corals, I noticed that there's something wrong. So I kept swimming, I was like maybe it's just bleaching, something, the common stuff that we observe and then I saw like lots of corals like dying and declining and I was like what's wrong? So I took some pictures and I sent it to my country manager and she's the one that made all the contacts to other organizations and a few days afterwards it was confirmed. It's like the disease right here. It's here all right and SCTLD is killing the corals by eating away at the tissue and leaving the bare skeleton behind. There is no hope for regeneration once the disease has completely taken over the colony. There is a pronounced difference between healthy corals and infected ones. These are healthy corals. They have depth in color, but they lose that when they have the disease. When a colony is infected with stony coral tissue loss disease, the first thing you'd be looking for is what's called a lesion, which is a somewhat circular patch on a colony that you can clearly see the skeleton beneath it and also the tissue that's beginning to slough or kind of slide off. If you would wave your hands over it gently and use the water to make kind of like a current over it, you'd see that flesh kind of moving and moving in the water and you know it should be very much attached to it and very much a part of a, of a live coral. Now since the disease was identified in Belize, the fisheries department has had several meetings with all its NGO partners. They have been researching, collaborating with marine biologists and experts from Florida and the Caribbean to find out more about this disease. But there are no clear-cut answers. The thing is that it's not definitive what causes it. That's what the research is showing. We know it's a bacteria. We know it's a bacterial pathogen. Research has shown a combination of things. It could be more than one bacteria it could be another disease combined with a bacteria we know it's waterborne we know it's carried off by the currents and we know it's carried from one side to the next by direct contact but given the aggressiveness and severity of this disease authorities must take swift action it took a collaborative effort to come up with a temporary experimental treatment that would have the least harmful effects on the marine environment. We came up with three types of treatments. One would be the chlorine that we're using, antibiotics, and then culling. We suggested and recommended to the fisheries administrator for us to do the shea butter and chlorine because Shea or cocoa butter? Shea butter. Shea butter and, and chlorine because that at the time seemed to be the best choice for us. And that's this mixture. The chlorine powder is added to natural shea butter and then it is mixed until it has the right consistency. Then a slab of clay is flattened into a tortilla shape and it is used as a base to coat the infected coral so the paste does not dissolve. 
the treatment is then taken out to sea. A team of marine biologists and conservation scientists is gearing up for a shallow dive in the Bacalar Chico Marine Reserve. They're going to collect footage and treat the hard coral colonies that are affected by the stony coral tissue loss disease. About 30% of the corals in this area have been infected by this disease. Now the team hopes to contain this disease by applying and monitoring a DIY paste every two weeks. As the team hit the water, they carried the chlorine and shea butter paste in a syringe and the clay formation near the affected site. The paste is then poured onto the flat clay surface. The treatment is then quickly carried under the water and placed over the lesions on the tagged corals. Now, since this treatment was first applied in July, there haven't been any improvements. But according to Fisheries Marine Reserves Operations Manager Alicia Ek Nunes, it is too early to write it off as ineffective. We're still running the testing, and so we'd have to wait a little bit longer in order to do a second assessment um, on all the areas to see if we were successful or what percentage of the corals had success. So the research and testing continues to identify the cause and the best long-term treatment for this lethal disease. The hope is that this disease does not spread to the entire reserve or worse, to other parts of the country. That's an outcome too tragic to contemplate with life-altering effects on the reef, the livelihoods of those living in coastal communities, fishers, and the tourism industry. But it is a frightening and very real possibility that the team needs to urgently prepare for. Reporting for 7 News, I'm Courtney Weatherburn. The National Coral Reef Monitoring Network will meet on September 11th to discuss national surveys and scaling up treatment methods. As you heard in the story, the disease was first detected in Florida in 2014 and since then, marine experts there have been researching and conducting lab tests, among many other interventions. But still, they don't have any concrete answers either. We got an interview with the director of the Smithsonian Marine Station in Florida, Valerie Paul. She also manages the Caribou Key Field Station, which is located on an island on the reef in Belize. Paul discussed some of the efforts that have been tried in Florida to better understand this disease, but also underscored how little is still known about this outbreak. One of the things that we've been doing in Florida in our laboratory is trying to develop uh, probiotics. Those are bacteria that are beneficial. Uh, you may have heard of probiotics for um, a, uh, in yogurt and other things to aid in digestion and, and restore beneficial bacteria in humans to our digestive system. Well, we're trying a similar approach in the corals by treating them with the beneficial bacteria that might produce some antibiotics on their own that can help fight off the infection. And in the laboratory, we're having some, mix, uh, some good success with that. We're hoping to try some of those interventions in the field soon as well. We don't really understand the spread because uh, it jumped from, Mexico, uh, from Florida to Mexico, but also some other countries at the same time, like the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, doesn't seem to be explained, the spread doesn't seem to be explained very well by current patterns. So uh, we are worried that maybe shipping uh, through ballast water or um, biofilms on the whole of ships or other means might be contributing to the spread. We really don't know at all what's going on. So this is a bit of a, a concern uh, because we don't know really where it's going to spread next. The good news is that not all, all even within some of the uh, coral species that get the disease, not all individual corals will succumb. Some we've been able to see uh, can fight off the disease and recover. Uh, some, of the uh, some of the large boulder corals can do that. According to the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary website, the disease is affecting corals in Florida, Mexico, Belize, the Dominican Republic, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. It is also suspected to be in Jamaica. Again, the cause and pattern of spreading is unclear at this time. 
Although not much is known about stony coral tissue loss disease, it is still important to monitor it and prevent it from spreading. The newness from the fisheries department discussed how you can help in this effort. We contacted our partners at the Ministry of Tourism who then contacted um, BTB and other partners with the education and outreach materials, asking all our stakeholders that come in contact with the reef environment to please, if you see the disease, go to the agra.org website, report the disease. If you can take pictures of it to send it to us, we need to know if it's already spreading to the rest of the country so that we could respond. We also ask that everybody that goes diving to please maintain your buoyancy. Don't take back anything from the reef, meaning trash. Um, you know, don't take back anything from the reef. And if you must take back trash or anything, put it in a steel bag and take it back with you. We ask that you rinse your gears before, during, in between dives and after your dives. So if you go diving and snorkeling anywhere in the country, be on the alert for this infected, these infected corals. And snap a picture if you can, but do not break off a piece of the corals. Just take a picture and send it to the fisheries department. Their email is fisheries underscore department at fisheries.org.gov.bz or you can call the office at 224-4552. You can also contact C or Fragments of Hope the Coastal Zone Management Authority, and Healthy Reefs for Healthy People if you want to provide any additional information. We will keep following this story. And we take a break now, and when we come back, we'll tell you about two fatal accidents that have claimed lives in the Belize and Toledo districts, plus all the debate from today's Senate meeting. Stay tuned for those stories and more. We live in the South. So when my son decided to attend UB in Bini City, I was nervous. He always needs money for school. Give me five minutes. Once I transfer it, I'll give you a call. As a career woman, I used to worry how I would get him the money quickly and safely. But with apps, now my biggest challenge is saying no. At least I'm happy I don't have to leave where I am to send it every time. The IFT is one of the features of apps implemented by Central Bank of Belize to enable banks to provide customers with services to make electronic payments quickly, safely and securely anywhere in Belize. With apps, I can multitask and feel like a superwoman because it makes doing business in this economy easier. Now parenting, that's another story. Apps. Fast. Safe. Reliable. Parting at the highest level, platinum style, at the biggest weekend in Belize. We're talking more tickets to the Belize September Festival Weekend Street Fair featuring Nessa Preppy and Mato and White Russian Friends on September the 9th featuring the long-awaited Fizzla Colonge. Thank you, Mama, for the nine months you carried me through. There's so much going on in the world. Simplicity we used to survive. Man. Vanessa Bling, Jacko. All you gotta do is text PARTY to 3444 and win this mega package, which includes six platinum tickets, one private booth, one bottle drink of your choice, personal waitress, photographer with visits from the artist. Only one dollar per text, so the more you text, the more chances to win this mega package. Promo ends on Wednesday, September the 4th, so remember to text PARTY to 3444 and win! Fantasy 5, the biggest game in Belize, continues to do it bigger and better than any other. Fantasy 5 pays out $500 for matching 4 numbers and $25 for matching 3 numbers. Match the letter drawn and claim your free ticket. Get all 5 numbers drawn in game night and you are the winner of the jackpot plus the accumulated amount. It is without a doubt Fantasy 5 is the best. best. Fantasy 5 continues to draw live and Belize into the bone and Channel 7 every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday at 8 p.m. It's the best game in Belize, Fantasy 5. We bring entertainment and dreams into people's lives.
The Honorable Patrick Faber invites all to his call it constituency endorsement and official launch of his Path to the Future campaign to become the next party leader of our beloved United Democratic Party on Sunday, September 1st at the Civic Center in Belize City. The event starts at 11 a.m. with sporting activities and entertainment for the entire family. The official ceremony begins at 1.30 p.m. with the official endorsement of the Honorable Patrick Faber and the unveiling of his inspiring leadership bid for the UDP. You can tune in live on Channel 5, 7, Wave and Love TV starting at 1.30 p.m. or on Facebook starting at 1 p.m. on Patrick Faber's page. Sunday, September 1st at the Civic Center. The Honorable Patrick Faber, The Path to the Future. The transition of a loved one to the afterlife is hard on its own. And unfortunately, the burden of financial expenses to conduct a burial can make that difficulty even harder. Thankfully, the Social Security Board provides a funeral grant to assist with the burial of your loved one. The funeral grant is available in the following three categories. For the debt of an insured person, $1,500 is paid towards funeral expenses. For the debt of an insured person's spouse, the benefit is $1,000. For the debt of an insured person's dependent child, the benefit is $500. Want to know if you are eligible? Visit our website or contact any of our offices to have someone assist you. Also, be sure to visit our Facebook page and give us a like to stay informed. Social Security Board, safeguarding you, your family, your future. The first to bring nationwide high-speed fiber internet to Belize is again taking you into the future with the opening of our state-of-the-art Digi Signature Store, offering the amazing service you've come to expect from Digi. This ultra-modern signature store at 2.5 Philip Colson Highway is the place to buy the latest devices, sign up for Digi services, pay your Digi bills, and take advantage of all Digi deals and promotions. The first of its kind in Belize, the Signature Store offers the most amazing customer experience with its new and innovative design featuring the latest in technology and a gaming center powered by the fastest DigiNet speeds. Visit the Digi Signature Store today for an experience unlike any other. Come see what Digi has in store for you. providers in Belize, CBC strives to provide our customers with the highest standards of quality, value, and service in all aspects of cable TV and internet. Monitoring our systems closely, our technicians combine creative planning and state-of-the-art technology with years of experience and training to develop and provide the most reliable and advanced cable and internet service to exceed your expectations. For CBC and our team of talented engineers, technicians, and customer service representatives, delivering less than the very best is never an option. Police were called out to the corner of Vernon Street and Lindos Alley at 5.30 this evening, where this Ford Escape was left abandoned on the sidewalk.
Reports say the driver had to flee after he came under attack. Eyewitnesses in the area tell us that the driver had allegedly injured his common-law wife and was trying to speed off when bystanders who saw what he did attacked the SUV, punctured the tire, broke the back windshield and caused various other damages. Police were still processing the scene up until a few minutes ago. We'll have more on this on Monday. 27-year-old Rashid Pollard celebrated his birthday yesterday, but lived less than three hours into his 28th year. The father of two died in an accident just before three this morning. It happened at mile four on the Philip Golson Highway. He was driving back into the city after a night out celebrating his birthday with family and friends in Ladyville. But something went wrong and he slammed into a lamppost, which caused his vehicle to flip. A post-mortem later revealed that Pollard died from traumatic shock due to multiple blunt force trauma. Earlier today, his aunt told us how terribly the sudden death has devastated his family. It was his birthday and he was out with family and friends. And um, I got a call this morning about 3.30, some quarter to four, when my daughter called me crying and um, said, Mom, come. And I got up. When I got outside, she said, Rashid dead, and I said, no, he can't be, not my darling, not my baby. And he said, she said, yes, ma, come. And I said, somebody please take me to the hospital. And we went to the hospital, and um, I waited there. They still had him on the road, because it happened about mile three, four on the Northern Highway. And they brought him in, I saw him, and it wasn't a dream. He was gone. The last thing I, he said to me last week was, darling broke me out because you know not asking me for my birthday or talk to me. And I said, no man, we ain't see each other and we ain't get a drink. But I never get to see him. Not even to say happy birthday. I did my post yesterday evening and said happy birthday to him and, and have a blast and enjoy your earth day. And he did. He passed away right after his birthday. Rashid was the most loving, fun person. Rashid would walk into our room and light up that room and make everybody smile. He know how to bring people together. He knows to make them smile. Rashid is a very outgoing person, a people's person, whereas he works with BTL and he was well loved there. Rashid is um, a person that would come and make you smile. For me, he stole my heart from the day he was born and now he broke it. But what can I say? Life goes on. He was the only child of my little sister. And what I can say is we have to be here for her and be strong for her. I know he broke me down this morning, but now I got to be strong back. And see how this will go from here. I know that my kids used to say, Mom, Summer is not for us because we had so many losses the beginning of summer and now the ending of summer, Rashid went. I could say he's in a happy place and Rashid died peacefully and happy. Pollard leaves behind two children, a daughter and a son. And there was another fatal accident that claimed the life of another man, this one in southern Belize. At about 2 this afternoon, 37-year-old Greg Paris was riding a ninja-style motorbike when he lost control and crashed near Medina Bank Village between miles 63 and 64 on the Southern Highway. Paris was flung into the drain and died on impact. His passenger survived and was rushed to the Southern Regional for treatment. Paris, who works outside Punta Gorda town, was traveling northbound to Independence Village. We understand Paris is a newlywed. A series of three loan motions were passed in the Senate today, which authorizes the Barrow administration to borrow a total of 148 million Belize dollars to execute important government projects. The first motion for a loan from the Inter-American Development Bank for a project to strengthen the country's tax administration. The government will borrow $28 million to improve the abilities of the newly amalgamated income and GST departments. 
which is now known as the Belize Tax Service. The goal is to improve the capacities of these tax administrators so that the way they conduct business is more efficient and therefore results in, the, in increased revenue collection. During the Senate debate on this loan motion, business senator Mark Lizarraga had a rare congratulation for the government. Here's that. We are intending to increase the government's effectiveness in tax collection and modernizing through technology the infrastructure of this department aimed again at improving uh, tax administration governance and its operational processes. And the business community supports and um, has been in fact championing and calling for this for a long time because when we have situations uh, of inequity where some people, some sectors contribute and others do not, or some players and other players do not, it creates for a less than competitive uh, business environment. The playing field is not level, of course. It is a disincentive to investment um, and growth. So we certainly encourage and will support this motion. We are particularly pleased in that for the first time, we have some semblance of what this project will entail. And, and, I, and I thank the government and congratulate the government for... That's not true, I have in the past, that's not true. But I thank, I thank those responsible for providing us with this document so that we have at least now I can say to you, the people who will pay back this $28 million in one way, shape or another, what it is that we expect to get from the spending of this $28 million. Perhaps this is a first. In terms of the purpose of this loan motion, we have the strong support of our NGO network. And just to repeat, what the purpose is, increase the government's effectiveness in tax collection by modernizing the technological infrastructure and improving tax administration governance and operational processes. We fully support that, just as we supported the, the passing of the tax administration and procedure bill two months ago, which in effect established the Belize Tax Service Department but there's a but, we have some questions. A main concern that we have is what we see as the exorbitant amount. Today, colleagues and President, we are being asked to approve almost 150 million Belize dollars in loans. Almost 75 million US dollars. So it is our responsibility to look critically at what has been sent to us and to ask the questions that need to be asked. The second loan motion that was debated in the Senate today was another from the IDB for 20 million Belize dollars. It's called the Contingent Loan for Natural Disaster Emergencies and it is supposed to be used in times of natural disasters to quote enhance the comprehensive disaster risk management of Belize by fostering improvements in the five main areas. Disaster risk governance, risk identification, risk reduction, disaster preparedness and financial protection, end quote. Here's what the NGO and business senators had to say about this one. I arise to give my strong support to this loan motion. It goes without saying that being in the middle of the hurricane belt, we need as much of this type of support as possible. This is the one major question that I had, the one, the one item that I was not able to clarify that I think it would be useful for us all to know. If we look at the second page of the draft loan contract, section 103, special definition, subsection B, it states, Eligible event means the event that meets the characteristics and conditions of the type, location, and intensity specifically described in the terms and conditions of coverage included as Annex 1 of the operating regulations. 
Uh, no matter how hard I tried, and I must say that I, I, to the, and I reached out to the Minister of Finance, I, 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 they, they did respond, but I was not able to get a copy of the operating regulations so that we will be clear what constitutes an eligible event. It might, we, uh, you know, we might say, but it's obvious. Well, it's not completely obvious. And as an example, we have seen our beaches over the past couple of years uh, under direct attack from, from sargasm. That there, 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 there are many that are now saying and advocating that we treat this sargasm influx as an emergency from natural events. It's a naturally occurring situation and it has created a major emergency. It would have been good to see if this is one of those eligible events because it has been having a direct toll on our economy. The government of Belize is embarking on another loan today of some 20 million Belize dollars for what, it's, what it calls is a contingent loan facility for natural disaster emergencies. And it identifies five areas that it is targeting with these funds. It identifies disaster risk management governance, and I can't tell you what that means. It, dis it identifies risk identification. I can't tell you what that means. Risk reduction, I can't tell you what that means and how deep it goes, because these are very open-ended it says disaster preparedness, and I can't tell you what is the plan, and it tells you financial protection, and I don't know in what areas and how. Unlike the previous loan motion that we saw, that clearly articulated what these sums of monies were going to be used for, there is absolute silence in the documents that we are presented as to how and what is the strategy in each of the five areas, and how much money will be intended for these areas. We don't know what the plan is. It's very loose. It's a condensed. But the biggest loan motion of the day was the one for 100 million Belize dollars. The government of Taiwan has agreed to lend the Belize government that entire sum at concessionary rates to upgrade the Corozal Sartineja Road and to build the Pueblo Nuevo and Laguna Seca bridges. For this one, several senators complained loudly that for the large sum of the money that the Senate was being asked to give permission to the government to borrow, there were hardly any detailed breakdowns about how the funds would actually be spent. That triggered a lengthy back and forth, and here are a few excerpts of the debate. No one, no one will argue that that road and those two bridges are not needed. They're desperately needed. I've, I, I have traveled that road over the years many times, and I feel for the people of Sartaneja, Chunush, Kapabank, Lit, you know, Little Belize, Progresso. The road has been in bad condition. And I recall over the years, a couple times I've driven on that road and I've seen a sign along the road saying, loan secured, road construction to begin soon, designs and construction. The people in that area have been promised an upgraded road for many years. This one, I hope is it, but as usual it, with some of these loans, and this is the big one today, 100 million Belize dollars, we have questions and some concerns. So it's 100 million Belize dollars, that's a whole lot of money, and it adds substantially to what we already owe our good friend uh, Taiwan. The present administration's main development approach has been one of infrastructure, infrastructure-led, and that when you look at it closely, however, we will see that this has, in fact, had 
serious negative ramifications on other sectors of our economy. So much resources have been directed towards infrastructure. It reminds me, Mr. President, or if you wish, I could use an analogy of a bodybuilder who focuses just on his bicep. And the bodybuilder is able to produce quite a handsome bicep. But all the rest of the muscles are weak because they have not gotten the attention as that bicep. The Senator just mentioned in his remarks, we, Senator Salas just mentioned, the people of that part of our country have been waiting for years and years for this road. And we are grateful that the road is now going to be put in. But we wonder why it has taken so long to address that matter, when in fact we have had other expenditures in infrastructure that have gone before this one. The infamous $180 million to Caracol. Mr. President, I'd like to use the opportunity to, to genuinely welcome the, the two new senators to the upper house. To welcome, and clearly you have demonstrated in your first presentation that you are not shy. Well, when you're not shy, then you have to be responded to. So you ask why this government has taken so long to put that road. Senator Zabani, you should ask your party. Ask the PUP why it took so long for them and why did they not ever, ever build that road for those people in that area who time and time and time and time again return the area rep and his son and the government to that seat in that area. Why? Now here comes along a UDP government. And it has no political implications, Senator Zabani, none whatsoever. Today, we will borrow over 100 and somewhere around 150 million more. Right? Adding to this big burden we have already. And again, for the most part, we don't know what it is that will be delivered. And that is sad. That is a tragedy. As an educator, as a nurse, there's no way that I can approach a patient to say, we're going to be doing X, Y, and Z in terms of procedure and not give total information to the patient in order for the patient to give informed consent. So when I look at this particular um, motion that is before me as a senator, I took my oath this morning and I'm privileged. And I know that the Belizean people will be expecting me and my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues, to be able to take a position that will be in the best interest of them. And so when I look at this motion, I'm thinking to myself, it has a very good timeline in terms of payback, whatever, whatever economic um, terminologies that are used. However, if you can't tell me how you're going to be spending the money, that brings concern to me. Questioning the particulars of this contract is what we're here for. It is important for us to know exactly how each cent will be spent because it is the taxpayers of this country who will have to repay it, Mr. President. And so when my friends on the other side get up and they make a big noise, oh, why you want to know these little nitty gritties? You're not an engineer, you won't, you won't understand it anyway. That is not the point, Mr. President. The point is that we owe an obligation to the people of this country. That is our job.
from there, the Senate moved on to bills brought from the House of Representatives, and among those was the Belize City Municipal Paper Bill. As we told you, this one will allow Mayor Bernard Wagner and the current PUP administration to sell bonds commercially, which will give them more cash flow at rates cheaper than commercial borrowing. You'll have noticed that several of the senators kept returning back to the fact that they knew very little due to the lack of background information provided by the government on the three previous loan motions. It was during the Senate's debate on the municipal paper that Attorney General Michael Perfit suggested that the complaining senators were only doing so because they were taking a partisan anti-government approach. Here's how he made that point this afternoon. Mr. President, may I? Attorney General. Where is the cry for all the details? Where, where, where are the details? What projects will the, the Belize City Council be doing? What, what will it be building? How many streets? How many bridges? What size? What lane? How come you don't need details now? How come you don't need details now? The details, people, where are you? Where are you? Hmm? How come you're not crying for details for this one? Huh? Because it's the benefit of PUP, Belize City Council, which the government has no problem in doing, Mr. President. We understand that the municipality needs support. And once again, we're doing for a PUP City Council that a PUP central government never did for a PUP City Council. We're allowing them to float a bond so they can manage the affairs for the betterment of the city. And I support this motion with very little to no details, Mr. President. One has to admit that over the recent years, both yourself, your administration, both this administration, government, and now the present city council, are taking advantage of the monetary realities in the, in the world. All of these loans that are being gotten at concessionary terms, Mr. President, is because the lending institutions are awash with cash, interest rates have come down substantially, and then they push money, then they beg on for borrow money. Now, I take no fault, as I did then, or I, as I do now, with people trying to take advantage of the lower interest rates, the surplus availability of funds in the system, because certainly the private sector, not the borrow, we don't have a lot of confidence, we're afraid. The government, if you look at it, the government has mopped up most of the liquidity in the system, over a billion dollars, right? So there's no reason why the city council should not try to improve its cash flow positions by buying long-term money at cheaper rates. I congratulate them. If that's what you want me to get up and say, I congratulate them. Right? And it says right here, if you haven't read, Attorney General, it says to retire any existing debt or liability, refinancing. That's a good thing. Right? To fund the interest reserve. That's a good thing. OK? So, Mr. Pre Mr. President, to smooth out short-term cash flow variability and to reduce short-term financing costs, because you know the cash flow situations you faced, right? So, if there, I mean, I don't know what you want us to say. I think you should be happy that we are supporting this motion. I think you're happy. You should be happy. But you are trying to be your jolly old self and. You know, trying to be facetious. Another bill that sparked quite a bit of back and forth at the Senate today is the National Liquefied Petroleum Gas Project bill. It was tabled at the last House meeting two weeks ago, and the model being proposed in this bill is a public-private partnership where the state would protect a monopoly on the supply of LPG, which we know better as butane. The project proposes that a new entity, which is called the National Gas Company, will take over the responsibility to supply the entire country with butane. It will be a major shift from the current state of affairs, where one Mexican supplier owns all the major butane companies in the country.
This project envisions a new supply mechanism where the national gas company will ship LPG to a bulk port facility in Belize, which should, in theory, bring down the transportation cost. They will be given a 15-year term of license to supply butane, and they will build three facilities, which will be handed over to the government when the license ends. Here's what the senators had to say about this project during today's debate on it. This is one of those initiatives that leaves one dumbfounded, and I will explain. There's a lot of material to review, which, I, which we reviewed, and I prepared a checklist. And with your permission, I'll go down through the 18-point checklist. In relation to liquid petroleum gas, what we have right now is a Mexican-controlled oligopoly check. The bill at hand right now is supposed to replace that by a monopoly check. Belizeans want reduced cost, or put another way, increased savings when it comes to LPG consumption check. The project would be supposedly a model public-private partnership project check. Supposed to be under a boot, build, operate, build, own, operate, and transfer agreement. Another check. At the end of 15 years, government will supposedly, and I emphasize supposedly, own the project. Check. 83% of households use liquid petroleum gas. Check. That amounts to roughly about 12 million gallons of LPG annually. Check. Sounds like, like a lot, but in the big scheme of things, it's a drop in the bucket. Real there's a real possibility of savings to consumers not guaranteed. Check. The ability to provide savings to the consumer will be much greater after 15 years after the investment has been recovered. If you had read the entire documentation that was sent out regarding this bill and its definitive agreement, you would have seen that two cents from every gallon that is sold will go to beef up the Bureau of Standards that sets the rates and governs the beauty and industry. Similarly, we have one company providing water. We have one company providing um, electricity. And so what you must do, some things are just natural monopolies. And, and so what happened now, you have a company now that's going to be, yes, a monopoly, but you will have a Bureau of Standards that will be regulating that company. Just like how you have the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, regulates the, the, the electricity and, and, and water and telephone, for example. So the, the, there is no, there will be a body appointed by the government to ensure that the rates being charged are fair. We have a body, the Bureau of Standards, which controls, can control, or in theory, can set the wholesale price of LPG as well as the retail price of LPG. But that body is hamstrung in its ability to set the wholesale price of LPG. You know why? Because we have no idea what it costs to bring LPG. We have to take the word of the importers that this is what it's costing them. Because we have no way of knowing how much it's costing to come through the um, port, the bulk port in um, Honduras. Now, when that fuel is landed directly in Belize, and what I did, I, I, I reached out to, and I wanted to find this out particularly. Will the cost of LPG be lower landed in Belize than it is now? And the answer is yes. And from what I have seen, the answer is yes, at least by a dollar. Because they didn't dream up this. They have studied it. Government will take an initial share percentage in the entity during this 15-year period, at which time the 
entity is going to own the facilities completely. At the end of the 15 years, government gives back those shares, but government acquires all the facilities. As far as I understand, there are three facilities. One, the bulk port at um, Big Creek. Two, uh, there's a Belmopan facility um, just outside of um, Cotton Tree, just outside Belmopan city limits, as I understand it. Um, and then there's one just outside of Orange Rock Town to service the northern part of the country. I think once you look at this, once you, once you really consider the benefits, um, monopoly does not necessarily have to be a bad word. The, the, the reality is that we cannot have 10 pe people building a bulk LPG facility in country because it's expensive. This is costing about 30 million US dollars, I understand, at least. We don't have people beating down the door to, to, to invest uh, this type of money in country. So it has to be that a small economy like Belize will only have room for one. So there has to be somebody who is going to be the exclusive importer of, of, um, of LPG into, into Belize. And right now, that's what we have, you know. We only think that that's not the case today. But the, the, the LPG companies that are, bringing, that are bringing LPG into this country are controlled, as far as I understand it, by, by, by the same people. Now we also spoke about the fact that government would be taking over and maybe somebody can explain to us what is in place for public officers to be trained to take over these facilities at the end of these 15 years. I heard that by then we would we'll become experts at butane. We can only become experts if we are trained. And so I want to know what is in place. We want to know what is in place to train our public officers to be able to take over these facilities at the end of this 15-year period. Kudos to the investors that came up with this innovative plan and sweetened the pot and said, government, here's your 25%. In lieu of taxes, one model could have said, look, the government would regulate, encourage, Competition, which we certainly, both organizations that I represent, subscribe to. We believe in competition, in innovation. Because at the end of the day, we believe when you have a competitive environment, the consumer will benefit. This bill, as well as the others, all passed in the Senate today. The bills and the loan motions will become law when the Governor General gives his consent. And we take our final break now, and when we come back, we'll tell you about the fire around the city dump and how private and public sector are trying to contain it before it gets into the toxic heart of the dump. Plus, Belize's teenaged male and female footballers, they're dragon slayers. You'll hear of their regional exploits when we come back. Corruption. You have heard this word countless times, and did you know that it has different forms, such as grand corruption, political corruption, and even petty corruption? It doesn't matter the form. Corruption is a dishonest or illegal behavior done by persons in all sectors of society, and it should be a concern to us all. A major reason why it continues is the lack of accountability for these actions done by these persons. And for us to start stopping corruption in our country, we must start holding these individuals or groups accountable. Let's work together to stop corruption in Belize. Corruption affects us all. Comfortable, affordable, and powered by the trusted Cummings ISF 2.8 liter turbo diesel engine. 
we change the way the game is played. The new Photon Tunneling Truck and View CS2 Van. Available at Universal Hardware. Photon, the game changer is here. is an important part of our everyday lives. That is why we at Atlantic Bank are committed to use the latest technology to make our customers' banking experience easier, convenient, and most of all, secure. We now offer you chip and contactless cards. These cards contain an embedded chip which generates a unique security code each time you perform a transaction, making it virtually impossible to copy your card's information. It's like a new password created for every transaction. You can be more confident than ever that you are protected, giving you the peace of mind that you need when making everyday purchases. Using your chip and contactless card is easy. For a chip transaction, Insert your card into the POS terminal face up, chip first, and follow the prompts. Leave your card in the POS until the transaction is complete. Remove your card and sign your receipt. Performing a contactless transaction is even easier. Tap your card on the POS terminal, wait for the beep to confirm your payment, and go. Remember, use your card to make everyday purchases anywhere you see the Visa logo displayed. Atlantic Bank, chip and contactless cards. One card, two ways to pay. Atlantic Bank, building the future together. The Honorable Patrick Faber invites all to his Call It Constituency endorsement and official launch of his Path to the Future campaign to become the next party leader of our beloved United Democratic Party on Sunday, September 1st at the Civic Center in Belize City. The event starts at 11 a.m. with sporting activities and entertainment for the entire family. The official ceremony begins at 1.30 p.m. with the official endorsement of the Honorable Patrick Faber and the unveiling of his inspiring leadership bid for the UDP. You can tune in live on Channel 5, 7, Wave and Love TV starting at 1.30 p.m. or on Facebook starting at 1 p.m. on Patrick Faber's page. Sunday, September 1st at the Civic Center. The Honorable Patrick Faber, The Path to the Future. Dengue and Zika alert. Do your part by preventing mosquito breeding. The Ministry of Health reminds the public that as we enter the rainy season, be aware of the dangers of dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. These are infectious diseases that are transmitted by the bite of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. These mosquitoes are most active in early morning and late afternoon. Activities that should be done to prevent dengue and Zika include Avoid having containers that can collect water in your yard. Cover water storage containers such as drums. Change the water in flower pots every four or five days. These are ideal breeding sites for the mosquito. With the elimination of breeding sites in and around the yard, 
dengue and Zika can be avoided. Dengue and Zika begin with sudden onset of high fever. Other signs and symptoms include rash, joint pain, eye pain. If you are pregnant or planning to become pregnant, we advise you to visit your nearest health facility. The public is also encouraged to use mosquito repellent spray or lotion on the body or clothing. Do your part by preventing mosquito breeding. A health and wellness message from your Ministry of Health. Belize City residents, especially those on the south side, woke up this morning to a blanket of thick smog and the filthy smell of burning garbage. And that's likely because the wind shifted overnight to blow in from the west. 
What you are smelling was a bushfire that has been touching at the edge of the city dump for two weeks. Everyone only learned of it this morning when the wind blew the smoke into the city's population center. This fire is being caused primarily by the persistent hot and dry weather conditions, as well as moderate winds. But the situation is worsened by overgrown bushes on the properties surrounding those sites. The National Fire Service in a press release today says it has been working with the Belize City Council and the Belize Solid Waste Management Authority to control, contain and prevent all fires surrounding the old Belize City dump site and the new transfer station. They stress that while these fires did not originate at the dump site, there is the ever-present danger of them spreading to that site, where the fires would be much more difficult to extinguish. Today, when we went to the dump, we didn't see the fire service. We saw a team from Cisco Construction hard at work with a, with a water tank and a bulldozer trying to put out the fire, which is concentrated right now above the old dump site. Francis Woods from Cisco told us that the smoke has been affecting his company's headquarters for some time now, and they are trying to effectively snuff it out before it spreads to the larger dump site which, in his words, would cause weeks of misery for the city. When he and his team retired this evening, the situation was under control. But they have to keep monitoring because there's heat underneath and flare-ups can easily happen. On Monday, we told you how Belize's female under-17 national selection did Belize proud by coming out on top of their group in the CONCACAF 2020 qualifier. The games were played in Barbados, but their return was delayed by Hurricane Dorian. So they just returned today and were whisked to the Marion Jones Stadium for a congratulatory press conference and luncheon. They teamed up with the boys' Kodakadere gold medalists, who also shocked the region in their play earlier this month. The national sports director outlined their accomplishments. It's the first time in anything football related in Belize we were successful in Central America in, in capturing a gold medal. We defeated the big, big countries like Honduras and the finals we played Panama. And to be honest, when I got the news that we were playing Panama in the finals, I was a little bit of a doubt in Tamas because Panama has one of the best development programs in the region. But also, with our representation being from the Belmopan Football Association, I from the jump, I said, Belmopan has one of our better football programs in Belize. They things start from the age of eight right up until uh, up until seniors, and you know, achieving that this is a, a once in a in my lifetime that I've seen it at any level in football that we've captured a, a gold medal. Additionally, on top of that, they use 17 female national team. Again, it's the first time we've sent out a delegation. Well, we as in the country because it is, of course, um, through the Football Federation of Belize, sent out a female delegation in this age range. And I can also say it's the first time ever that at any levels in female football that we were able to top our group in a CONCACAF qualifier. So they have actually um, advanced to the next group for the CONCACAF U20 World Cup. So today, if you notice, we have the Minister of Sport, we have representatives from the Football Federation. You know, we will be, we, we decided to host this congratulatory dinner for the for the kids to show them that you know your efforts are not going unnoticed additionally we'll also be providing through the ministry of education and through the uh, minister of education um, deputy prime minister honorable patrick faber a school grant to every single one of the athletes that medaled in both for the code Kadir and for the u17 national team as well i must say that it's a it's a good time to be a Belizean. You athletes have made us so, so very proud. That it is true working with the young people, encouraging them from the very early stages, working through our schools, but also working through after school activities and nurturing the talent of our young Belizeans that we will continue to bring home the goal. Let's give them a round of applause, please. You were able to score four goals against St. Kitts and Nevis as well as um, against the Virgin Islands. The Virgin Islands. Talk to us about about this. Um, I 
Really, we said before we wanted to make history and we went to the mentality out there too. We had the mentality that we were going to win and make our, our country proud. And how did you learn to play football? I learned to play football with my cousins when I was so small at the village of San Antonio. I played with boys when I was so small. So small, what age was that? Um, when I was six. Which country was the most difficult to play? Um, for sure, Panama. They were the biggest in size. They were um, physically big and muscular, but we all have different technical abilities. And our um, advantage was we play ball, the ball on the floor, and they're more like in the air, right? So that's how we won against them. How do you see this in terms of a in terms of a long-term commitment for you? Um, football. Is, that's what I'm aiming for. That's the um, goal I'm trying to reach. Um, my, I want. My goal is to reach the MLS in the um, States. I am an American, so I have a big opportunity to reach that spot. So that is my goal. And uh, school comes first. Everyone, the, the minister said, education is everything. And I have to study and work hard for that. So that's my goal. And while those teenaged phenoms light the way to a stellar football future, the news continues to be bad in cycling. Last night, we told you how Belize's national road champion elite cyclist Nissan Arana has been suspended for four years for the use of a banned substance. Well, tonight there is news that another top rider, this one a Mexican who's always a contender in Belizean races, has also been suspended. Mexican Donizetti Vasquez finished fourth in this year's Creme New Year's Day Cycling Classic. The sample taken after the race tested positive for dexamethasone, it's a type of steroid medication with anti-inflammatory effects that is usually used to aid an athlete's rehabilitation. With that, Vasquez has been stripped of his fourth place finish, which ironically was right after Nissan Arana. Ron Vasquez will now take that fourth place spot. Vasquez has been suspended for two years, commencing May 31st, 2019. Tonight at this hour, the Image Factory is opening a new art exhibition by Cuban artist Carlos Rafael. Rafael's show in Belize is part of the Image Factory's ongoing efforts to strengthen ties of friendship and solidarity with Cuba. This morning, we were invited to a viewing of the exhibition and got to speak to the artist about his inspirations and how he came to, it, to the exhibit in Belize. This exhibition that I've brought now in August 2019 is an exhibition that is made up of more than 50 paintings. I've brought landscapes, I've brought some portraits, and I've also brought some fans. I bring things from Cuba, Belizean things, and Caribbean things. Cosas de Cuba, cosas belizeñas, y cosas caribeñas. The team is diverse. I am a painter who does not always like to work serially. I like to change so as not to get bored. My work gives me this possibility that today I can make a landscape, tomorrow I can make a face, I can make an abstract. Anyway, I am an artist, although I am 45 years old, I think I am a young person and I am trying to do my best as a painter so that people who come to the art gallery or who just like art can somehow come and take a little piece of Belize and Cuba tonight at 7. I think that it's an opportunity for the Belizean public to come tonight and the rest of the days that this exhibition is going to be here to enjoy contemporary Cuban art and somehow have an exchange, the public 
with me and I with the public. I will also be creating live art inside the show that will be put on by the trio of Perote. The trio, which is from here in Belize, they will accompany me in the exhibition. Carlos Rafael, along with other artists and professionals from Panama, Belize, and Mexico, are among this year's carnival judges. And the route has just been finalized for the carnival, which those international judges will oversee. This year's carnival, which starts at 1 next week, Saturday afternoon, will have another new route this year. It will start, as usual, on Central American Boulevard at the corner with Farmer's Road. And from there, it will go, as usual, onto Central American Boulevard. But after it crosses the Belkin Bridge, it will turn right onto Freetown Road and then left onto St. Thomas Street and head straight to the Marion Jones Sporting Complex. And that's all we have for you in this Friday night. Thanks for watching. I'm Courtney Weatherburn. Remember that you can see streaming video of this newscast at 7newsbelize.com, courtesy Diginet, the ultimate internet experience. Have a good night and a great weekend. Join us back here on Monday. Evening.